Christ. And then Paul expands it in Colossians 2.16. He said, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. That's, that's an imperative. That's a commandment. Paul says, Do not judge someone concerning when they worship. Leave them alone. If they worship on the Sabbath, it's fine. If they worship on the first day, that's fine. Okay? That's what the Word of God is teaching. Jesus was continuously being accused of breaking the, the Sabbath. Over, and you remember when He went through the cornfields, they plucked the ears of corn, they said, you broke the Sabbath. He would heal, remember the guy with the withered hand, he said, stretch forth the hand, he healed him. They didn't care about the guy, they didn't care about healing. All they wanted to talk about was he broke the Sabbath. And you know, if you'll go back and study all those instances, Jesus never said, I did not break the Sabbath. I did not. He never... He never defended himself. He never tried to do it. He would say stuff like this. Which one of you hypocrites, if your ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath, you won't pull it out? Right. I mean, you broke the Sabbath. But you know what? Sometimes you have to do what you have to do. That's what Jesus said. And that's why I'm saying when we come into the Sabbath, this, this fourth commandment, I don't think that the, the point of to, to stick out is the exact day. I think it's the principle behind it. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But Jesus said in Mark 2, 27, 28, and he said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. The, the, the fourth commandment is teaching us that we need a day of rest. We need a day of reflection. Think about America right now. How badly does a revival tabernacle need a time that we just stop everything and set it to the side and say, Today, it's the Lord's Day. What would that do or not? Even on Sundays. Some of you guys are so busy. Even on Sunday. You're going out to eat. Nothing wrong with that. But you come to church. You go out to eat. You go over here. You go over there. And there's never really any reflection on God. And that's what the fourth commandment is about. We need time to think. We need time to reflect. We need time to unwind. We need time to, to bring our families together and worship devotions and pray together and just really get our minds on God. Those four are our relationship with God. Are y'all okay? Can I go just a little bit longer? Y'all yeah. not going to fall out and sleep on me? All right. If you do, just sleep on me. So. The next six are dealing with our relationship with one another. Matthew 22 and 39. The second, Jesus said, the second commandment is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Number five, honor your father and your mother. This has been one that I've had to work on because... For a long time, my mom says that we're both hard-headed. But here's the thing about it. My mom gets to be hard-headed. I think that there were times that we would argue and I was right and she was wrong. And there's times that we'd argue and she was right and I was wrong. And there was times that we were both wrong and we, whatever. And there was times we were both right and we are just saying it in different ways. But I finally came to the conclusion it doesn't matter. She's my mom. And I've said that joking and laughing, but it's... I'm serious about it. The devil tried very hard to separate my mother and myself. And one day, I just woke up and I said, Lamb, you're a sinner. You got four children, or three at the time. You got three kids, and they desperately need their grandma, and their grandma desperately needs them grandkids, and you're proud, and you're arrogant, and you need to honor your mother. So you know what I decided to do? Even on the days that I feel like I'm absolutely right, I just shake my head and say, mm -hmm. because mama's going to be right from now on. You know what I've been teaching my children? Don't you ever correct your mom. If you absolutely know beyond any shadow of doubt that your mom is wrong, you nod your head and say, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree. Don't you ever disrespect her. Right, man. Guys, I know the debate. Well, I have a parent that's not respectable. I, I don't have to honor them, but you don't have to dishonor them. You don't have to talk about them. You don't have to talk down about them. You don't have to bring them up. You don't have to rip them up. You don't have to be mean to them. You don't have to be cruel. You can keep your mouth shut and move on. There's a difference. It's extremely important. So yeah, yes, there are parents that are absolute scumbags. Somebody shout amen. And they've hurt, they've abused, and they, they don't deserve any respect. They don't deserve honor. But you know what you deserve? You need freedom. Yeah. from bitterness and you need freedom from anger yeah. and so I'm asking you you don't have to trust it would be crazy to trust certain people 
Don't ever trust people that's going to abuse you, but you don't have to let them control your life. You can have freedom from all of that pain. God can heal you, and you can get to a place where you may not be able to respect them, but you don't have to vocally and emotionally disrespect them. You can just be quiet about it. And let God sort it all out. Right? Is that, is that okay? Are you all okay with that? I hope so. And I hope I'm not pushing that too far there. Number six, thou shalt not kill. That's Exodus 20, verse 13. Now, I heard a guy say one time, I mean, he's a good guy. The Bible does not say thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not kill. Now, he, he was trying to be eloquent and powerful and prove a point. The problem is, Jesus in Matthew 19 and 18 interprets, Thou shalt not kill. With these words, Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder. The Bible does say, Thou shalt not murder. In fact, it's better translated murder. Because the facts are, them uh, tilapias we demolished today, they was killed before I even. The chicken that bird demolished today, and something, well, all of them were kids. Dead. Somebody killed that joke. Right? This commandment can't be thou shalt not blanket statement kill. And then you get into this, this debate about self-defense, etc., etc. Most of the men in this room are going to tell you right now, you come into my house, you're going to try to molest my wife and my kids, you're going to die. You're yeah. not going to say that lightly. Amen. I'm going to yell at you, I'm going to scream at you before you come to my door. But if you come in my house, and you threaten my, my family, my, I'm going to do everything I got to do. I don't want you there. I would rather you went home and went to sleep and left me alone because I don't want to hurt anybody. I love people. I want this person saved. But I promised my wife and my kids and my God that I would protect my family. I'm going to do that. And God may correct me tonight before I go to sleep and I'll repent and ask you to forgive me and teach you what God has shown me. But at this point, you see, because there's a big difference between that shot not kill and thou shalt not commit murder. Yeah. And he uses the same terminology. But I think I've proven my point. It can't mean blanket statement thou shalt not kill. Then we'd all have to be vegetarians. <laughs> and that, ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah. Homie don't play that. <laughs> <laughs> thou shalt do no murder. It has to be because even after the Ten Commandments, God has commanded war. They killed many people. Okay, they were defending their nation. They were defending their whatever. Murder is just cold-blooded. Murder is without cause. Murder is, is, is wicked in the sense that you're snuffing the life out of someone without a just cause. And I'm not saying that we have a license to just go around killing people. That's what pastor said. <laughs> a pastor, I see it in the Richmond Rangers, and say, oh. <laughs> Those bonkers. Don't no, only kill her husband, kills her free ex-husband. Because pastors say, do not hurt anybody. Okay? But there has to be a distinction made here. Do no murder. To just take someone's life, it's an egregious sin. You don't do that. That's why you've got to keep your anger under the blood. Yeah. That's why drugs and alcohol and all this nonsense is so dangerous. Yeah. You lose your senses. Anything that will impair your mind, your emotion, it's wrong. Yeah. Be not drunk when it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The only thing that should control us is the Spirit of God. Angry people are dangerous people. Right. I've dealt with anger my whole life. Every day of my life I have to wake up and God has to help me. I have to put that on a cross and leave it there because... I am capable in myself without the harness of the Spirit, without the love of God, without the power of the Holy Ghost, I am capable of almost anything. How many knows that you don't kill somebody because they hunt their horn at you? Raise your hand. Y'all in agreement with me, right? You're at McDonald's and you're trying to order a Big Mac and they're... Argh! Listen, 30 years ago, did you hear the term road rage? Not 30 years ago. 30 years ago, 1970, 80. There was no such thing. You didn't hear that. But you've heard of the term road rage now. What is road rage? It's what I just described to you. Driving down the road, you don't turn your left turn signal, 
talk to any kids, you reach down to get a donut, you take a left, and you cut in front of somebody, yeah. and they go ballistic. <laughs> they pull up on your bumper, hit the back, they don't come out, they do sign language, they just get up in front of you, slam on the brakes, and you about hit them. And now everybody's mad, and once the devil's getting ready to do something bad. You jump out, it happened in Jackson County just a little while ago. A little exchange, yeah. four wheeler, run out the road. Next thing you know, guys put the board a gun. Well, he didn't know other guy had a gun, right? Bang, 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 bang. And somebody's dead. That's a sin. Yeah. I don't know about the guy having to protect himself. That's a different story. But anger, you see, anger, 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 anger. It has to be covered in the blood. Because an angry man will do violence. Angry woman will do violence. Is that clear enough? At least give you something to pray about the distinction between thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not murder. Let's go on. You shall do no adultery. Leave my wife alone. Or we'll have to discuss the previous commandment again. <laughs> Somebody shout, Devil in Jesus. <laughs> Leave my wife alone, my brother. And an American sister, too. Leave my wife alone, sister. <laughs> That's pretty self-explanatory, right? Do I, I don't have time to go to Jesus' teaching that if you look on a woman, you love to have her in your heart. But that makes sense because the tenth commandment is thou shalt not covet. Sure. Right? Amen. I don't have to steal your wife. I just have to want your wife. And I am an adulterer. That's right. Yeah. If you're my brother, why would you want my wife? You should want me to want my wife, and you should want my wife to want me, and you, as my brother and sister, should want me and her to be madly in love. In fact, you should be of such a brother, you should be your brother's keeper. In fact, if you knew somebody else was wanting my wife, you ought to be my keeper. Instead of saying, I don't think so, Hop Rod. You're getting ready to challenge us to the sixth commandment there with Brother Lamb. You leave Sister Lamb alone. That's the way it should be. I said, back up. Get off, Sister Audrey. You don't need me talking to her like that. I'd do it in a heartbeat, sister, if I caught somebody trying to mess with any of these sisters in here. I wouldn't even hesitate. i say, you need to back up. I mean, Sister Misty, you're a married woman. Some joke would come up messing with you. We want to we handle it. We're not going to kill it because that would be a sin. <laughs> We're not going to do that. What? It'd be crazy. You protect my wife, brothers and sisters. Yes, Sister Alice. I've been reading in a proverb about adultery. Okay. And it says that in the will of adultery may be forgiven by repentance, his reproach will remain. <coughs> for his scars are never completed. Now, you can if be forgiven by repentance, what does the reproach mean? It means it won't be okay. wiped out? If I take a nail and a hammer and I go to that wall and I nail that nail into the wall, I can pull it out, right? Mm -hmm. So the sin is gone. Okay. But there's still something left behind. Okay. So Sin has I effects. I you, but I won't. There's cause and there's effects. Okay. okay. I could be committing adultery. I could come out of that, but I'm still going to be called an adulterer. And I don't have any right to get mad at anybody. Okay. I committed the crime. So now I have to bear the reproach. Okay. Now, the, the slate is wiped clean between me and God because the blood of Jesus is there and washed right. it away. But the reproach is the same. Okay, the approach doesn't go away. It will, it will bring that up. It will, it'll be brought up. Absolutely. Okay. Well, when you think about how many people have come to this church, they've come to an altar, they've lived 40, 50 years and done nothing but just tore up Jack. They've, they've, they've slept around. They've, they've got 67 diseases, stuff I can't even name. They have, they have took men's wives and husbands and blah, blah, blah. And they come and they get saved. And I believe they can be saved. I believe that they can, they can stand up, wash in the blood, have a new life and be free. But they spent the last 50 years drunk and high and living like a devil. They don't just get to walk out of here and no one, they earned their name. There's a reproach. Okay. There's a reproach. There is, I mean, there are effects. And a lot of times I'm like, they're like, well, why don't folk leave me alone? Because you spent a lot of time earning your name. So what do I do now? You do the reverse. You live holy for the next 50 years. Right? Sister yeah, right. Alice, when you came, yeah. you got saved genuinely. But six months later, there were people out there yeah. that would have never trusted you. And if I had walked up and said, you know Alice Cutler, sister girl, yeah. she ain't worth a nickel. Yeah. Well, you was worth way more than a nickel. You've been bought by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, should you get mad because they thought you was a... No, because you earned that. You was a drug dealer. You did crazy right. stuff. But now, there might be an occasional one out there that don't know the story. Right. But pretty much everybody, now if I go back to them and I say, you know, Alan's coming. So that's not just adultery, that's all sin? That's any sin. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, he's just teaching a principle there that when you sin, something is going to follow him behind you. Okay. okay. Yeah, you're going to have to suffer the repercussions. Okay. So, yeah. And it's not, it's not, it's not talking about God bringing it up, Sister Alice. It's just talking about your, what you've done. God's not going to bring it up. He's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. They're gone. That's why when a person gets saved, they've got to concentrate on God. They've got to connect to God. Because there are going to be people that are not just going to let you walk away scot-free. But I will tell you this. Every true brother and sister want you to be saved. Every true child of God wants you to be covered in the blood. And they're wanting you to do right. They're not, these guys that want you to fall, they're not saved. But some, now, you come and you, you've been high for years. And you come and you get saved. You've been stealing and, and ripping from everybody. I'm going to watch you. Okay? Unless I just know you. Don't get mad at me. No. You're the one that's been stealing and robbing. And what you got to do is live holy. You live holy six months, eight months, a year, 12 months, 14, two years, five. Sometimes I'll give you my checkbook. Give you my wallet and say, go get stuff. That's just the way it is. So you have to bear the reproach that you brought upon yourself. You know what the answer is? Stop sinning. <laughs> Somebody shout amen. amen. No murder, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. That's self-explanatory. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. Basically, don't lie on your neighbor. Right? Teach your children this, guys. Don't let your children just lie. Treat that as an extremely serious thing. Amen. It's, uh, you know, don't you lie to me like that. No, you should spank that child. Uh, it has to be disciplined. It has to be corrected. Because a child that is taught that it's okay to lie will also steal. A child that is taught that they can lie and they can steal will also commit adultery. Yeah. Because that's all you're doing is you're stealing another man's woman or wife or whatever. You got me? So we've got to teach. And thou shalt not cover. <coughs> thou shalt not cover. Why, why, is that, why is that a sin? Because I should want you to prosper, man of God. I should want you to be blessed. And if you're blessed, and, and I esteem you to be blessed more than me, I should still be glad you're blessed. Covetousness is stemmed from pride. I feel like I deserve more, and I feel like I deserve more than him. But he's got something that I don't have, and so I want it, and I'm coveting it. So it's not, it's not that simple. I just want his stuff. There has to be something innately wrong with you. That you don't want your brother. Now, there's nothing wrong with me seeing a sharp truck and say, I want one just like that. Nothing wrong with that. I've seen T bone steaks that I wanted one just like that. But if that T bone steak was on Brother Samuel's plate, now I might, I might cover the steak out of from you. You got my point. There are people that cannot be happy that you're blessed. Yeah. Have you come across that yet? Yes. 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 Now they'll cry with you. They'll weep with those who weep, but they have the hardest time rejoicing yes. with those that rejoice. You know you got a friend. You know you got a confidant. When you can share, okay, I'll, I'll explain to you as a pastor. And guys, our church is not perfect. We've had our ups, we've had our downs, but you know as well as I know, this is an incredible church. Wow. Right? Now, the thing that happens, and, it's, and it's, it's, you are guilty of it, most of you right now. I, I'm guilty a lot. We take it for granted. There are a thousand people, 10,000, 100,000 people that if they were here in this county, they'd be in this church. We'd have, yeah. we'd have to have four, church, four services yeah. and a 5,000 seat capacity. And there's a lot of people that want what we have, and we take it for granted. It is very difficult for me to find a pastor that I can call and share the victories that we have here. Mm. Okay? It's hard for me to say, dude, we had like six people get saved today. Because they haven't seen anybody saved in so long. And they think you're bragging. Yeah. And they're, they're so, they take it so personal, they can't rejoice with you. But man, when I'm on the phone with Pastor Mark Sarver, the dude's running 800 people. That's like a, a lot more than us. Six, seven hundred people. And it, it, he's like telling me people getting saved and ministers are starting. Do you think I'm upset about that? No. Like, Woo! My God, 23 people? God, 
I saved Sunday? Bravo. That excites me. And, and, and a year from now, Brother Andy said, Pastor, I don't know what's happening. 162 people was here Sunday. We got, we got 60 here. Let's just say we had 60. Brother Andy, I ought to dance. I ought to cry with you and jump. And I ought to be running around the church and say, man, God bless the tabernacle. Yes! Bless Brother Andy. Bless South Irvine. That's the way we should be. When you get a new car, I mean, brother, sister, you drive an Escalade. If I was going to covet after a vehicle, I would covet after that beautiful, pearly white Escalade. <laughs> Lord, move on and give it to me. <laughs> I've never one time thought, why there? Why would I do that? Do you know how happy I am, brother, that God has blessed you? And you, your new car. Man, you drove right in that hoopty. Oh, yeah. Go away. Who? <laughs> Bless your heart. It'd be raining. Just an hour that duct tape on the window. She had to poke a hole in the plastic just so she could breathe out the plastic. <laughs> and she come up in here in that beautiful white car. Sister, my heart blew up. I didn't have a new car. I still don't. I bought a car. It's 10 years old. I wasn't like, I'm a pastor. Why you bless me? That's ridiculous. I've been serving the Lord for 22 years and she's been serving the Lord for... Why, that's dumb. But listen, guys, you can you see that? Yeah. It's everywhere. And if we're not real careful, we'll be that guy. Yeah. How'd they get that marriage? Yeah. Yeah. How'd she get that man? Yeah. The question really is how did I get her? You know what I'm saying? I know that I'm dapper and all that. But I pale in comparison to the glory of the First Lady. God did this. God did this. And God can do it for you. You got me? Let's stand across the house. Everybody okay? Listen, if I said.